qualified to, to speak today and, and thanks Michael for the kind words and uh, you're right yes for, for my sins I was medical director here for the last few years but uh, as of Monday no more. So I was medical director during COVID-19 which I didn't know would be the case when I signed up but there you go and there's times you look back and you think my god what would I have been doing with my time if there hadn't been COVID-19 but I think I would have filled it somehow. I'm going to speak today about really about the palliative care services. So obviously rheumatology and, and uh, gerontology have services here. I'm not really going to speak about those. Um, I also work over in Tala Hospital and, I, and I'll mention one or two things from Tala, but basically I'm going to focus on the, the OLH palliative care service. So that will be the, that'll be the focus of today. Um, and some of you will probably have used this before, slido.com. I'm hoping to get a little bit of interaction from the audience, which is hard to do uh, in the virtual setting. So we're gonna try and use this. So if you would, I'd appreciate if you'd switch on your phone or whatever it is beside you there and go to slido.com. You don't need to download anything or an app or anything like that. Just go to that website. And that should give you a means of answering questions. And I have a couple of questions for you. Um, and the first question I'm hoping is fairly rhetorical. Uh, so the question is, are you hoping I finish my talk a few minutes early? And two options, yes, that'd be great. Or no, you're an amazing speaker and sunny evenings are overrated anyway. So let's just see if we can get this working. Well, I didn't expect it to be as split a decision <laughs> as that. Okay, I don't know who's being polite and who's being foolish, but uh, okay, okay, we have an answer. Be careful now, I'm gonna keep talking and talking. <laughs> okay, well, that works. Okay, so that's that's a, sort of a, an easy warmer upper question to start on at 50-50. Oh, well, look, I'm, I'm gonna finish a few minutes early. I'm not, I won't ignore that survey. Move on to the next question. So not a, not a difficult question either, just, you know, as you're coming towards the end of today's moving points, a question, you know, which version of moving points would you be more likely to choose to attend in the future? I mean, is virtual the way forward or would you be, would you prefer to be sitting in the education and research center here in Harold's Cross? And I'm not sure what my answer would be to this actually, but just seeing where people are coming. So there you go. It looks like, it looks like a win for virtual. Um, I'm probably a little bit surprised at that. Okay. So the next question is one I'm more interested in and probably a little bit more difficult. How hard has COVID-19 been for you? Um, there's no definition of that. It is whatever it means to you, but how hard has COVID-19 been for you? 10 stars means it was extremely hard. Um, and when you look at the two years that have gone by and are still going, just how difficult has this been for you? So again, take a moment and just click and we see what we get on that. Right. I'll give that just a couple more seconds, but I think that's most people have answered. Isn't that interesting? Um, so the numbers are very high. Um, a lot of sevens and eights, some nines and tens, um, and some two, three, fours. But a lot of people have had a very hard time over the last couple of years. So again, I'm not sure what I was expecting on that, but it's a very clear answer really that this has been a very hard couple of years. Having said that, there is, there is a, a divergence of views there and some people are at the four, five, sixes. Um, I think probably I'm one of the four, five, sixes. And I think that maybe points out my first lesson, the first lesson I wanted to bring your attention to. So I th I've, I've come up with five or six lessons or learnings from, um, from COVID-19. Um, they're very much my view. You may not agree with some or any of them, but in no particular order, lesson one was my observation that in terms of COVID-19, we were, we were all in it together, but in different ways. And what do I mean by that? Well, I think, COVID-19 has been a very much a shared experience across society, across the country, across the world. Um, and I'm hard pressed to think of anything that really has compared to that in my lifetime. You get things like a World Cup or the Olympics where briefly, maybe 
a large part of the world are looking the same direction, but it's still a, a tiny fraction compared to what COVID-19 and how that swept in everybody all across the world. And you felt like everybody was involved. Everyone you met on the street, or perhaps you didn't meet them anymore, anyone you spoke to, anyone you WhatsApped, everybody was thinking COVID-19, talking COVID-19. And while we were all in it together, we were all in it in very different ways. It was a very personal experience for all of us. Um, I was very lucky through COVID. Um, personally, I had good health. Uh, my family had good health. I had no loved ones who died, nobody close to me who died, or indeed nobody close to me who got very ill from COVID. Um, I had a secure job, a job that was important during COVID, and, and it was good to feel that I was doing something that mattered. Um, so I had a very lucky time through COVID. Many, many people did not have. Um, and clearly, what you take from COVID and your reflections on it and your learnings from it are all defined by what your experience was. So my experience was, was a particular one, but uh, very different, I, I know, to, to many, many others. So that's why some of what I say may not resonate with you at all. I think also true is, is your worldview to begin with. And, and I'm very much a glass half full person. Uh, always have been and um, possibly always will be. Now, COVID tested that a couple of times. It tested it in March, uh, March 2020. It tested it again in January 2021. Uh, really profoundly tested. I, for a brief period, I, I really was gloomy about where things were going. But that was short weeks and it passed. Uh, so for me, I, I dealt with this as an optimist. But thankfully, I, I also was with people who were pessimists and I needed that balance. I needed that balance to keep me in line, to keep me on the tracks and understand where others were at. Because again, everybody saw this differently. So that was my first learning from it. We were all in it together, absolutely, but in very different ways. I wanna talk a little bit about what happened in the hospice during uh, COVID. I, I have, as you know, I, or some of you know, I love data and I have lots of data slides, but I'm only showing a couple today. Um, Let's see this here. So in terms of palliative care admissions, if you just look up here, you can see that we've been sort of flatlining for a couple of years, about 600 or thereabouts, coming into Harold's Cross every year, moving up a little bit, 200, getting a bit above 200 in Black Rock. Um, along came COVID and down it went, really quite substantially. So that was about 620 something. Then it became 480. So a big drop, similar drop in Black Rock. Wicklow, by the way, first year of opening, so we don't have comparison. But so there was a big drop in admissions, and I gather that that was reflected in the other hospices uh, nationally, perhaps to different degrees, but a similar sort of pattern. And I'm going to come back a little bit later to why we think that happened. One of the, well, why didn't it happen? Why did, the, why did the admissions go down? Because we were getting less referrals. And why were we getting less referrals? Because our community team had less people to refer to us. Well, why was that? Were they seeing less patients? No, the opposite. So our community team similarly had been uh, sort of flatlining for a few years, having had very steady growth for the preceding 10 years. We've been sitting around the 1200 new patients per annum for a few years. Then along came COVID and that 1200 went up to 1450. Uh, and that increase didn't occur in January or February. A lot of it was squashed into the first few months of COVID. So effectively overnight, our uh, new patient referrals jumped by about 30%. And they jumped by about 30% at the same time as we had large numbers of staff off uh, sick because of COVID, either with COVID or more likely because they were, um, they had to be off, they were close contacts. So this, again, is very much, I think, what, what other palliative care services saw around the country. Uh, and that increase still largely there in 2021, but dipping back a little bit. Lesson two for me then was how quickly our world can change. And I suppose, like many people, I've, I've lived through a, a time where there's been very few major world events. I think the, the biggest world event in my adult life, and I have crept into my 50s, you'll be, you'll be shocked to hear, but the, the biggest adult event in my life um, was 9-11. 9-11 was phenomenal. I, I can still obviously remember where I was when I heard the news. I can remember sitting in front of the TV, aghast and stunned. 
that's been the biggest event in my lifetime, I think, in the news. I think COVID has, has trumped that and how quickly it came, how suddenly it came and what an, what an enormous change it was. Um, and I think it pointed out the, the fragility of our world in a way that I had not seen before or hadn't understood before. It also pointed out the interconnectedness of the world because what started in China swept across the globe so quickly and it crept to every corner of the globe. So again, it, it hadn't, I hadn't thought about the world in that way. And change is something that we see and we, we see society, society does change. And we, we've seen, for example, we've seen threats to society, climate change being the obvious, but that has been so slow and so sort of omnipresent being discussed for years and years. This was so different and so sudden. Um, and I think what has maybe emphasized that feeling of sort of fragility and interconnectedness is what is currently happening in, in Ukraine, that that coming so quickly after COVID and with its own dreadful awfulness um, and shockingness, again, really has made me, I think, see the world differently. So our world can change quickly in a way I really hadn't believed was the case. And, and Donald Rumsfeld was right. Now, I don't know who of you will remember Donald Rumsfeld's speech. I, I think a good few will, but he was the Secretary for Defense uh, in the US during one of the uh, Iraq wars, Iraq invasions. And he came out with this, what I think was a super line when defending some of his actions. He said, there are no unknowns, things we know that we know, and there are no unknowns, things that we know we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns, things that we do not know we don't know. And I think this pertains very much to COVID. There were things that we knew. There were things that we knew we didn't know and we really wanted to know. But then there were lots of things we didn't even realize we didn't know them. And it was the evolution of those things that very much defined and described, I think, what, what COVID was. To bring it back to the very start, I, I looked through some of my emails from week one of COVID. And week one of COVID for me was the second week of March, 2020. And there's an email from our first community patient who had tested positive, gone into hospital, tested positive. And the question was, what should our staff do? And we looked back at our staff all the way to the doctor who had assessed the patient four weeks earlier, and we wondered what should that doctor do? That was so little, that was how little we knew. At that stage, you'll remember, we were trying to grapple with the pictures we were seeing from Northern Italy. We were trying to think how bad might this get? How many might die? There were, there was talk of 40,000, 60,000 and more deaths in Ireland, that this could happen over 10 to 12 weeks. There was talk of running out of body bags, of running out of mortuary facilities, of needing new refrigeration facilities. These were things we discussed. These were things that we were seriously looking at and wondering, what can we do? Again, hard to believe, but at that stage, there was, and that same week, there's, there's a, a circular from the HSE specifically clarifying that face masks are not required and do not need to be worn by staff unless they're dealing with a COVID positive patient. Hard to believe now, but again, this was the start. Uh, and I think everywhere there was uncertainty, there was fear, uh, and there was a real sense of, sense of the overwhelming. And there were things that, things that we, we knew we didn't know. So, you know, okay, we can see COVID in the acute phase, what's it doing, but what might it do in the chronic phase? Is it going to be like shingles? Are people going to get a post-COVID neuralgia? We couldn't, we had no way of knowing that might happen. We weren't sure what the incubation period was. And imagine if the incubation period, instead of being sort of four to seven days, had been two or three weeks. Imagine how we would have dealt with that, how hugely more difficult it would have been. At that stage, we were beginning to see, we, we saw quite early on that, that COVID was mo a much bigger threat to older people. Imagine if it hadn't been. Imagine if we'd found that there was a variant which was equally threatening to children. I, I think that would have been a, a huge game changer in terms of how we dealt with it. And we didn't know what the mortality rate with COVID was. And uh, what was it going to be? Was it going to be 1%, 5%, 10%? We didn't know. So there, there were all these known unknowns. Um, but there were then the, the unknowns, unknowns, the unknown unknowns, for example. As we were preparing for all of this and, and, and appropriately anxious about all of this, we were trying to move patients out of hospital. And we did, in inverted commas, a great job of emptying out the hospitals. 
We've got patients home. We got patients to nursing homes. The red tape was cleared out of the way. It all became effective. It all became efficient. And suddenly, those people who would have been in hospital for weeks or longer, maybe even months waiting for a bed, suddenly we could get them to a nursing home. In retrospect, it's so clear how wrong some of that was, but we didn't know. It was an unknown unknown. Um, I remember too, we were, we were dealing with absenteeism and thinking, how will we deal with absenteeism? If people who are going to be off for whatever reason, out of work, how will we fill the gaps? At that early stage, we weren't thinking at all about the problem of presenteeism. The person who was coming to work out of a sense of, well, usually for the best intentions in the world, still coming to work, even though they had some aches and pains, maybe a bit of a cough, a bit of a, a runny nose, maybe even a slight temperature. Presenteeism was to be a huge problem and one that we never fully addressed. It was an unknown unknown. We didn't see that coming. In terms of the case fatality rate, it's interesting to look here. So it's very hard to know what the case fatality rate is. So what we mean by that is if, if a person gets this particular infection, what is the chance that they will die from it? And to do that, you need to know how many will die, but you also need to know how many people have had the disease. You need to know everybody who's had the disease. And oftentimes for diseases, we don't know everyone who's had it. But if you look at some of the sort of high profile infections, Ebola, we know 50% of people who get Ebola die. We know seasonal flu typically is about one in a thousand. It varies from year to year, depending on the variant and, and vaccination. Previous SARS version that, that had been around 10%, much less infective, but a much higher mortality. So, what was the figure for, or what was the case fatality rate for, for COVID-19? Well, it changed. It changed hugely at the start. When we were, these are the, this is the European figure and the, the Irish figure. Initially, the number was very high, or we think it was very high, or we thought it was very high. What was probably happening at that stage was that there were large numbers of people with COVID who we weren't testing and we didn't know they had the disease. Hence, that figure appeared to be six or eight percent, but was probably much lower. We became more accurate as we tested much more widely and we realized it was a, a much lower figure. And then as we developed various treatments, the case fatality rate dropped down and down. And currently the figure in Ireland is about one half of one percent. Yeah. But again, these were things that we didn't know and that we were having to deal with, figures we didn't know. And we were dealing with paradigm shift. So paradigm shift is when you see the world one way and then something happens and suddenly you realize actually the world is different to that. It's, or, so it's a different problem or a different solution or, or a different concept. And I think with COVID, we had a whole series of paradigm shifts. Now, let's see, I'm pushing my luck, but hopefully this has come up on your screen as well. And Gareth can let me know if it, if it hasn't come up. But hopefully you can see that there. So. This is a, from a, an Oxford website. It's looking at, at COVID data, a really interesting website, I have to say. And what we've got here are two tables. So the top one shows you sort of the new cases per million of population. And down here is the number of deaths per million of population. And it starts back in February 2020, and it runs through to, to June. And this is what we saw, that Italy, uh, as we know, was sort of first in Europe to be hit. And we saw the new cases there, and we saw the deaths there. And as... Italy was having significant numbers of deaths, and we were seeing these uh, on, the, on the TV. We were just beginning, and we, we sort of knew what was coming. The months went by, and things thankfully settled somewhat in Italy, but we were still rising at that stage. And um, there were two periods during the pandemic where we were close to the highest, uh, highest incidence or highest prevalence in, uh, in Europe. So at that stage, things were going up, then they came down. And we thought, here's where we are, we're coming into the summer 2020, we thought that we were perhaps coming through the, the worst of the storm. But we know that wasn't the case. And we had a real paradigm shift, because we came towards late 2020, we had a peak, and then another peak. Look at our figures there, we were the highest in Europe at this stage. And our deaths were also rising. And suddenly we looked back at the cases we were having here at the very start and realized that, that was nothing, hardly anything. But thankfully, thankfully by now, we, we were wiser. We knew about steroids, anticoagulation, about supplemental oxygen. We had more PPE. We were smarter to what we needed to do. And thus, the new deaths was nothing like it would have been if we'd had the same level of knowledge. So we were 
dealing with change, learning from it and responding, I think hugely impressively, as you'd have to say. But further time went by and we looked at that peak in early 2021, and we realized that that was a very small peak in 2021. When we look at what happened just two months ago, look at the numbers then compared to back a year before and compared to when it all began, a paradigm shift again, the world has changed. Again, look at the number of deaths. Of course, they've risen, but, and of course, for everyone who did die, the fact that others didn't die is, is, is no, there's very little sucker from that. But think what might have been if these numbers had hit us back then. And I suppose back then we worried that we might have case numbers like that. Okay, let me just take that out of the way. And there's just, if, if you look at it, so this is where we are today is over here. This is where we've been. These are the peaks of deaths that we've seen so far. What we don't know, we really don't know, is what lies ahead. And COVID has brought uncertainty. Just very briefly to look at this, I mean, in, in terms of what we did learn, we learned that, that COVID was much more dangerous to older people. This is what we know. If you were over 65 and healthy, even if you were sort of so fit over 65, your, your risk from COVID was four times that of an under 65 year old. So age was the, was the big determinant. Young people, thankfully, thankfully for most young people, the risk from COVID was very low. Not for everyone, but for most. Um, and then this is a number just sometimes, or I think initially there was a thought that maybe, maybe COVID will only affect those who are very, very close to end of life. Um, that maybe that will be the case, but that wasn't the case. Although the average age of those who died from COVID in Ireland anyway has been 82 so far, 82 or 83. In the UK, we know that on average, those who've died from COVID died about 10 years before they would have been expected to die. 10 years is a lot. Uh, and probably our figure isn't that different from the UK. So I think there have been lessons to be learned from the COVID pandemic, but it's probably more accurate to say that there are lessons we're still learning from the COVID pandemic. We are far from through this as yet. Okay, so let me just go back there. Next question for you is, so back to the, if you would, back to slido.com. And again, it's the, it should open up at the, at the right place for you automatically. So looking for your overview of how well did Ireland respond to COVID, where 10 out of 10 would be what it obviously would be. Um, what do you think in broad terms, the overview of how we did? Um, Okay, okay. Uh, all right, so we, we'll take eight as our uh, decent score. Um, and I think, I mean, who knows what the right number is and how do you defend or how do you define responding? Well, I've no idea. But to me, it's sort of a, a gut feeling. Yeah, I think Ireland coped well. And I want to talk a little bit why I think that was the case. So half of us are going for around eight as a score, some higher and uh, some around the four, five, six. Okay, okay, I, I would say that's a positive mindset. Okay, different question. How well did the organization you work in respond to COVID-19? And clearly I'll assume that if the results are good, you all worked in Harold's Cross and if the results are bad, clearly nobody uh, worked in Harold's Cross. So what have we got? Uh, okay. Okay, the numbers coming in. It feels a little bit like Eurovision, but um, okay. So again, I, I think that's probably. I need to look back. I, I think those are. Let me just see if we can. I think those are similar figures. Um, sorry, now let's see. Looking at that's for the organization and that's for uh, basically very similar, very similar, I suppose, maybe slightly more positive, I think, to be honest, but but very similar. Okay. Um, it's again, I don't know what to conclude from that, other than I think it's very interesting to see. And I think it's 
I think it's somewhat heartening that, that that's where people see that the response we have. Seven, eights, nines are very untense, are very, very good scores. Um, okay, so thank you for that contribution. Third lesson for me was that leadership matters um, and not all superheroes wear capes. I'll come back to that. You remember these addresses um, from Leo Varadkar and then subsequently from Michal Martin. I think they really, really mattered. Uh, I think that the tone of the leadership in the country, be it Leo Varadkar or Simon Harris or Paul Reid or Michal Martin or Tony Houlihan, I think these were hugely important. And I think that for me is a takeaway message. It so much mattered what, were we, what we were being told. We were being asked to do so much, to endure so much, to change so much. We had to believe in the people who were talking to us. We had to think they were part of this. We had to think that they were committed, that they were wise, that they had our best interests at heart. And I think by and large, the leadership in Ireland was very, very strong on that. Very, very strong on that. I don't know. If we'd had Boris Johnson or Donald Trump or many others you could name at the helm, how things would have felt. I think it would have felt very different. I think the extent to which we, we bought into what we needed to do, I think really was a reflection of the leadership. And I think the leadership was, was important. Uh, sorry, I'm having to switch between two screens here. Um, the, the, the leadership was, was so important to us there. It was important also within our own teams. When you were working on the ward, the people you were working with in the community team, if you were working, any team that you were working with in the hospice, it mattered who you were with. It mattered what you were being told to do, feeling that, okay, I'm involved. This is important. I'm being listened to. So the leadership was a really important thing. A curiosity that I came across was this, the global trustworthiness index, never seen it before, but okay, it's a survey of 20,000 people, give or take, across 20-something countries. They've done it for several years, but this was when they did it mid-2021, uh, so last summer, basically. And they put doctors and scientists up at the front, so there's a, a somewhat of a reflection of what COVID has brought. Um, I think for doctors, I would put in healthcare professionals, and I, I think I think there's a, there's a pressure comes with this and, a, and an onus with it, but it's also a, a great it, it also meant we could do a lot. I think people listened to the healthcare professionals, they listened to the science. And again, that, that means we were able to dig ourselves out of something of a hole, something of a huge hole. The bit about heroes, I mean, just to say very quickly, I was very uncomfortable with that. I didn't like the clap for the NHS or clap for your health service or whatever. I just, that made me really uncomfortable. And it made me really uncomfortable because there was no stage during COVID where I felt I was a hero. And I didn't like being called a hero. <laughs> and, and I didn't like a suggestion that I could move to the top of the queue in the shops. That was not for me, never did it. I felt wrong with that. And it felt wrong to me because there were so many other people who were doing every bit as much. They were trying every bit as hard and they weren't getting that recognition. And if I was them, I would have been uncomfortable. So the person who was behind the till in the shop or the petrol station, the person who was still emptying the bins from my house, the person who was making society run, those were doing every bit as important a job, I thought. Uh, so I was uncomfortable with the little bit of hero worship that, that came the way of the health services. Maybe it was helpful overall for me. I, I have to say that was just a little thing I found difficult. And thankfully, if we look here, the number of healthcare workers in Ireland who died from COVID, it was a relatively small number. Now it's not small, obviously, if you're one of those 23, uh, and I don't want to offend anybody, but Thankfully, I think our health cares, we, we got the PPE, we got the strategies, we had a health service that in some ways was able to protect us. The work was very hard, people were hugely stressed. But I think, I think healthcare workers were one of many groups who tried their best and worked very hard. And sometimes I felt that wasn't quite, that wasn't quite appreciated. I've also, I've always liked this quote, I've searched all the parks and all the cities and found no statues of committees. So G.K. Chesterton was not a fan of committees, but I don't know, I think some of the committees were phenomenal. I think Neffet did a great job. Uh, a committee of 30 people, if you'd asked me if a committee of 30 people could, could do good things, I would have said no, but Neffet did very good things. Our COVID task force in the hospice, that was a calm, organized source of wisdom. Um, I was very impressed by it. Um, there were loads of teams of all sorts of sizes in the hospice, which formed 
very quickly and worked very well. So I think individuals did great things, but I think groups as well did great things. I don't know how many of you were. The IPC, uh, the, this, this website, which had all the guidelines coming out from the government, a phenomenal piece of work, what was produced, phenomenal, really. The amount of documents that came out was, again, overwhelming at times, but it was so impressive. And uh, these were documents that by and large were well read, or sorry, were, they were well written, they were clear, and there was humanity in them as well. At an early stage, there was humanity coming in and not just kick for touch, do everything the ultimate safest and regardless of everything else. So very impressive, I thought. Lesson three, palliative care is still on the outside and we need to change that. What do I mean by that? Where did the people who died from COVID die? Well, they died in hospitals and they died in nursing homes. 1% died in hospices, 5% at home. So people with COVID, people who died from COVID, this is where they died. Those in the residential institutions, by and large, we did not see. We were in nursing homes, we saw patients with COVID, but a minority. And I think that will be one of the reviews, one of the questions that we have to ask. Why did COVID and, and the care of patients with COVID evolve in nursing homes such that we were very little involved? I think that's a real profound question for the palliative care services. In the hospitals, I think that's where we saw most COVID deaths as, as palliative care practitioners. But again, in my experience, that was patients in the very last short days of life, typically in the last 48 hours of life. We were virtually never in ICU. Um, and I think we were outside the loop in some ways. Did that matter? Did it make a difference? I would like to think it did matter that we could have brought something, but obviously it would be much better if it didn't matter, if things were being done well without us, the things we might have done well were being done well anyway. I don't know, time will tell on that, I think. And I think it's very important for us to look back at what has happened in COVID, to look back in detail. Nobody wants tribunals of the nature that we've seen in, in Ireland over the years, but we still, need to, we still need to learn from what has happened, and there's great scope to do that. But we also need to be careful of wisdom in retrospect and, and be careful of making decisions based on what we now know, because we knew so little when we were doing some things. Lesson four. This is my favorite parking meter sign. It's, this is a South African version of it, but if you want to see the real thing, it's in Dundrum. Change is possible. Where to start? Change was in everything we did and change came in so quickly. There are so many things we did that had to change quickly. And I could go through so many examples, but you all have so many examples. You changed how you came to work, what you wore when you went to work, where you sat at work, where you ate at work, who you spoke to during the day, how close you were to patients, what you were doing, how many patients you saw, if you were in their home, what you wore, how long you were in the house, whether or not you went to their home changed, whether you were bringing meals into the patient's room or not, whether you were coming to the hospice anymore or staying at home. So many things changed in our work life and in our home lives, and we managed that change. And um, huge change. Again, in my lifetime, in my adult lifetime, there hasn't been change like that in society. I think the hospice in two weeks in March changed more than it had in the preceding 10 years. Not an exaggeration, I would, I would definitely say that. In two weeks, more than we've done in 10 years. Looking at home care, we, we saw this, and every this is just picking one service, but we went from never doing virtual reviews to and it shot up in a couple of weeks like that, and then it came down again. And there were things we learned, there were things we did well, there were things we changed to and I wish we'd stayed, but we moved back. So reverting to the norm does happen, and that's something we'll need to reflect on. We, I think the scope for virtual reviews was not something we fully took advantage of, um, and that's something that we'll need to look at. Um, place of death. So these are figures from 2013 to 2019, and it was very static in our population where our community patients died, so our CBCT patients. Along came COVID, and huge change, huge acute change. So that the number of people dying at home shot up, the number dying in, in the hospice dropped significantly. So this was a big change that came in very quickly. And again, it's one of the things we need to reflect on. We need to think, is this a good thing or a bad thing? We don't really know how the quality of care was at home compared to back here. Uh, and until we know that, I think we can't know whether this was a good or a bad thing, but certainly it was a very, very acute change. Um, 
So we'll have time to look at that. And we know why that was. There were concerns about visiting, fears of infection, increased availability of family cares, all those reasons. Some will stay, particularly this one, maybe with more flexible working. So is this a long-term care, long-term change or short-term? We'll have to wait and see. Lessons four and five, and I realize I need to speed up a lot. Together, we can do great things. I could give lots of examples. I don't think I need to. I think we've all seen great things that were achieved. I want to point this one out. We brought in two and a half thousand admissions despite everything that was going on. I think that was well done. We had 60 COVID positive patients on site in total, really a very modest number. And of those, 25 had come to us with COVID from another healthcare facility. 22 came into us and had COVID already from the community and 10 acquired COVID while here. 10, of course, is not a good number. It's not good that it was as many as 10, but actually, I think by compared to a lot of settings, 10 was probably a good number. So all that IPC work that we were driven to do by Terry and team, it made a difference. We opened a hospice. How did we manage to open a hospice in the middle of COVID? We did, that was a job well done. Changes like this. So in, in April 20, there was a profound change to some of the pharmacy regulations around e-prescribing, duration of prescriptions, Imagine the organization to do that. So in the hospice, good things happened. Nationally, good things happened. And I think if you look at the number of deaths, and this shouldn't be the only measure, but the number of deaths in Ireland compared to many other European countries, compared to the average, was much, well, was much better than some other countries. This isn't the only measure of how we did, but it's a, it is an important one. Vaccines, it's almost beyond description what would have happened if we didn't have the vaccines. And that was a world achievement that the vaccines were developed. So change was possible. And I think maybe what we learned from that, and I'm going to finish in two minutes now, what we learned from that, perhaps we can bring forward in looking at climate change, perhaps it seems like a very different battle. But I wonder in terms of looking just at Ireland's response so far to the catastrophe in Ukraine, I think Perhaps Ireland is responding well, and perhaps some of that is learning from COVID, that we can do big things and we can do them quickly. So maybe there is a silver lining to all that happened. And lesson six is the silver lining. I think COVID brought appreciation. It made us appreciate things that perhaps we weren't noticing, perhaps we'd never noticed, or perhaps we'd stopped noticing. Visiting, I don't have time to talk about, but the, the absence of visitors made us appreciate how important visitors are. Um, it had never really struck me how absolutely pivotal they were until they were gone. Volunteers, until they left the hospice, you suddenly realised how many things we needed volunteers for. And little things mattered. They, they did a beautiful project in Tala Hospital where patients who were dying were given a heart, a knitted heart, which was made either by a staff member or people sent them in, and an identical knitted heart was given to the family. It was a beautiful little thing, very small, essentially no cost to it, but those little things were really important, really made a difference. And COVID, I think, gave us appreciation of all sorts of things that maybe we didn't notice before. This is a list for me. It, it made, gave me a better appreciation of good health, family, a trampoline, which was essentially our child minder, local parks, not having to wear masks when that came, being able to go to a restaurant, WhatsApp and memes, they kept me sane, technology, virologists, immunologists, ologists in general, um, Pfizer, Luke O'Neill, being part of something bigger, working with good people, patients, seeing smiling eyes, level heads, Netflix, resilience, perseverance, being lucky, well-stocked shops, people I could moan to, people who didn't moan to me, good weather, words of encouragement, Chris, Hope, Ireland, I think just of life. COVID brought an appreciation of that. So last slide, COVID was very difficult. It was very hard, but I did say it at the start, I'm an optimist. So I look at, as well, the positivity there was. And there was a lot of positivity. There was a lot we learned from it. And I think Albert Camus, this book from 80 years ago, or nearly 80 years ago, writing about a plague said, what does it teach us? That there are more things to admire in men than to despise. I like that line. Thank you.